All right. So today we are going to be talking a little bit about marketing with Haytham. I think uh, probably my favorite, my favorite name of a session, uh, how to screw up your marketing. Uh, so that's going to be the topic of the next hour. Two. So sorry, the next two hours. And we'll have a mini break in between. And then we'll have a break before uh, the debate starts. Of course, we had to, let's say a huge thank for Haytham. He just came back from paternity leave. This is his second day back. <laughs> and we're already dragging him to get, deliver a session after hours. We will um, be nice. We'll try to be nice. <laughs> we'll behave. <laughs> well, no. Happy to be here. Hi, guys. Hello, everybody. Happy to be here. Happy to jump in. So Haytham is part of the Entrepreneurship Center. Uh, so you'll be seeing more and more of him, inshallah, in the upcoming few weeks and months. And he's also part of the mentors. Um, Haytham, you want to introduce yourself? And yeah, go ahead. sure. Sure. Um, let's go ahead. Maybe I'll share my screen. Uh, it's good to see you guys again. We've seen a lot of you guys in the interview stage. And I recognize a few of you from EWC and other events before that. So it's good to connect with you again. Um, if I don't make any sense throughout some of this, uh, I'm running the sleep debt program, so I haven't been sleeping a lot lately, <laughs> as the guy said, but I'll try to keep this coherent. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. All right, cool. This is how to screw up your marketing, how to get started on the right step. A little bit of an intro. If some of you are marketers or CMOs, you probably have seen a lot of this stuff before, but just to kind of level the playing field to make sure everybody's kind of on the same, let's say at the same level, knows what's happening, is thinking about this in the right way. This is kind of a primer just to get everybody up to speed. Um, my name is Haytham. If you want to follow me on Twitter, it's at Adandos. Uh, I used to run a digital marketing agency called Digital Advantage based in Jinda. We had clients throughout the kingdom and the region. These are some of our clients. And this is not to kind of brag, but to show kind of the different types of work that we did working with startups, working with governments, and working with uh, large retailers, uh, e-commerce, and things like that. And marketing for each of those is a little bit different, which is something we're going to talk about throughout the session today. How do you market for a startup, and how is that different from marketing for a much larger larger organization like the government entity or an FMCG? And that has a lot of implications on how you guys do your work and who you work with. Uh, so I like to start with this graphic, because you know, a picture is a thousand words. Um, I want to see kind of hands in the audience, uh, Disney plus versus Netflix, uh, two competing companies. They've been in the news a lot lately, uh, looking at this graphic here, which company would you rather invest in, uh, and why? For me, it's Netflix. Why? The why is more important than the company. Because they have like everything for all ages, uh, can you hear me? I can hear you and I can hear somebody else who's kind of on yeah. a... uh, Guys, if you're not speaking, please mute. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, so I was saying Netflix. I would invest in Netflix. Yeah, can you tell me a bit more about why? Because it's like more... Uh maybe uh, how do you say uh, it's uh, everyone can connect with can can see something that uh, they can relate to with ages or uh, interests disney is more like uh, family movies or uh, a bit uh, okay I'm not sure if you can hear okay. me. So kind of the, the catalog and the age appropriateness of the content. Anybody disagree and think that they would maybe invest in Disney or think that Disney is the better company? And why? Uh, uh, can I talk? Yeah. Can you tell me who you are? Because I can't uh, yeah, for uh, me to see uh, who I, it is on the screen. There's like a... Ah, uh, okay. I'm, uh, my name is Abu Bakr. Uh, I think Disney because uh, they are pretty using the movies, so they have a history on in production and they have a lot of uh, movies they can do it on their platform and it will be exclusive for them. And there is an emotional relation between Disney and their customers. So I'm believing they will have a jump in soon. Yeah. 
Uh, okay, for me, this is Mohamed Atouni from Skadi. Uh, for me, I'll go with uh, Netflix because it has uh, a linear growth, stable growth. So uh, forever, uh, I, I don't like the companies that have booming growth at the beginning that come uh, go down suddenly. Uh, at Netflix uh, here, something went wrong. Uh, it's going to be wrong. It will uh, the drop will be. Uh, organized or is, uh, will, will be uh, decreased in, in a systematic way. Okay. Uh, also, database and uh, expand, uh, number of users, which means a lot of transactions, a lot of uh, cash flow stables. So uh, it, I think it will be more stable than uh, business. Thank you. Okay. So we talked about the uh, yesterday, right? You know, and and Disney's clearly gaining market share here, right? So there, there's something happening with the high growth. How do you guys think about that? Yeah, I think that Disney first is much more than just a, street, a streaming platform. So that's an advantage. And second, you can see that it has win like a lot of the market, almost ha like half percent in less than a year. So I think it has something that is a uh, been working and the rate is, as they say, like super big. So I think it's like a very good, as an investor, like a very good sign to see those, such numbers. Okay, interesting. Let's take one or two more opinions. Uh, I, may, I see a lot of hands are up. Yeah, so that is from Decisive. I would actually uh, go with Disney as well for the same reasons which, which Lucia has mentioned. And since we see like exponentially growth and there is still a room of like, you know, taking more market share, this would definitely like attract more investors since it's the beginning of the kind of launch of the new product which they have. So it will be more attractive because I believe customer uh, investors normally, they tend to go away from a linear growth companies and they prefer to go for exponential ones. Interesting. So one last, one last person before we jump forward. We've got like a lot of different opinions now. We've got Netflix and Disney. Can I, can I go? Can I go here? All right, go. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Okay, uh, I just want to speak for, for, for Netflix here because um, a lot of the acquisition, or it wasn't really acquisition, Disney sort of uh, transferred their customer base from a from their TV sort of network to a streaming platform, which is why I guess the you know ex exponential growth in the beginning. But Netflix is something that has been growing with the audience. Um, a lot of the global content where Netflix is producing shows for everywhere from India to the, in the Europe and Spain and, and you know, and, and all these countries are sort of getting on where the reach for Netflix is so much more beyond. People are so more, more required to that idea where anyone's asking, they were like, okay, Netflix, and it, and it works in a lot of countries. So a lot of these, uh, the South Asian region where I'm from and uh, some, um, the East region, uh, Disney Plus doesn't even exist at this point, at this stage. So that's going to take a while. And I feel like then it's just going to be stagnant for a while, just because they're just going to have their most of the Disney people come on and then leave after or or move to Netflix because Netflix is uh, a good bit like acquiring the target their their audience yeah okay. yeah if I can add one last one one last thing yeah. sure, uh, what sure. I can see that uh, from 2020 when Disney uh, was introduced till 2022 end of 2022 the slope of the chart didn't change that means Netflix was able to manage the competition. Okay, so they're still growing, even though there's a strong competitor that's there. Yeah, absolutely. All right, awesome. So this is all really good input, but you notice we talked about maybe two types of things, how fast they're growing and how stable is that growth and how that affects revenues. That's one category of kind of discussion. The other category was about uh, the content, whether it was age appropriate and things like that. We didn't look at like the underlying assets. We didn't look at like the value of the IP. We didn't look at the value of the technology. We didn't talk about, you know, the technology that they built over years, the servers that they have, right? And so what you notice in this exercise, you guys did a lot better than a lot of startups that I talked to in that you did consider the library, you did consider how they got those users. A lot of people just get fully distracted by the traction and they forget about everything else. And that's the risk with, you know, being judged externally because, you know, we like to think about our company, it's really hard to build the company. We focus on the technology and the IP and all the milestones. And then you talk to an investor and they, they look at like your traction chart and they judge you based on that completely. And that's a double-edged sword. So 
let's just say customer acquisition and marketing is very important because you get judged on it, but it isn't the whole story of the company. So you could get judged inappropriately if you have a strong company, but you don't have the traction yet. Right? And all of this is trying to say is the why. Why is marketing important? Why is customer acquisition important? Because it sways a lot of the decision around whether or not to invest in you, whether or not to actually consider this a strong company, the momentum that you have is persuasive for a lot of people, unless they sit back and think about the fundamentals. Uh, what is the value that's here? What is the audience that's here? What is the library and how is this going to be valuable over a long period of time? So you guys did a good job. You covered some of the aspects. Sometimes when I present this, they just think about the growth and it's all 100% Disney. They're growing faster. They're going to knock them out of the market. But it's good to, to have this in mind, right? And one thing to notice here is, did we talk about video views? No. Did we talk about impressions? No. We're talking about customers, right? And so when we talk about metrics for our company and we talk about marketing, it's really important to like really focus on what are the metrics that matter. And again, I said, I've worked with governments, I've worked with large companies, and I've worked with startups. Sometimes when you go out in the market and you try to find a marketer, all they're thinking about is top of the funnel impressions, uh, video views, number of followers. But really, this is kind of where you want to start to focus is how am I acquiring customers for my startup? And how am I growing my top and bottom line through that acquisition? So that's kind of the first thing I wanted to maybe touch on. Um, I'd like to go to this other example here. Uh, do you recognize the people that are on stage? Anybody recognize the guys on stage? Only Obama. Yes, Obama only. Only Obama. What about the guy on the right? You know, the guy who's smiling and proud to be with Obama. I don't know. Maybe the interviewer. The founder of Netflix? Uh, Netflix? Founder, yes. Netflix, no. We cannot see his page. Sure, yeah. His other face. Uh, it looks uh, like uh, Nike Elon Musk. Or Adidas. Sure. Who's the brother of Elon Musk? <laughs> nice answer. Nike. Nike. Uh, so, not Nike. No. So, the but, chat, we have Twitter co-founder and Anderson. Um, no, not not Anderson, not Twitter's co-founder. So this is Obama at a startup options. conference. Some options. Um, yeah. Okay, where do you think this is? Where do you think this event is happening? Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley. And why is Obama meeting this founder in Silicon Valley? Something about influencers. Improving the middle uh, strata. Because, you know, uh, motivating those young entrepreneurs to create innovations. Obama is retired. There's nothing better to do. <laughs> you know, this is actually when he was still the president. So the acting president I'm meeting sorry. with a startup founder. Um, any other guesses before I tell you the story? From the chat, uh, Ryan Smith. Did you attend one of my talks before? Or do you actually know who they are? Good I just job, remember, Andy. yeah, I just remember his name, but like uh, Qualtrics or something like this. Yes, this is yeah. Ryan Smith from Qualtrics, yep. He's a, he's a founder. The reason Obama's meeting with him is they, they created an amazing company. It's based in Utah in the U.S. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the story. So Ryan Smith uh, was working in a customer intelligence agency or a market research firm. Uh, his dad was working in a uh, university, MBA school. And at some point, Ryan went back to school to do his MBA, and he realized a lot of the tools that they used to do research when he was at the agency are really expensive and are not accessible to MBA students, even though MBA students need to do a lot of customer research and customer surveys. So they identified this pain point, which is kind of that there are people that need to have these tools, but they can't pay for them because they can't afford them. And so this is, a, uh, let's say, a typical case of targeting the non-customers, the people who are not able to be customers for your competitors because they're just being excluded by the competitors who are looking at maybe the top 10% of the market, the people who are affluent. So they decided to create a solution, which is Qualtrics, which is basically very simple technology. Customer surveys, which is really easy. It spills that data into you know sheets like customer data, and then it adds a statistical box on top of it so you can analyze the insights and come out with uh, some insights from your customer interviews. 
so that was the technology. He decided to build this with his dad. They built the company. Uh, they had this MVP of the tool. And then they went to market, basically. Uh, when they wanted to go to market, it was the financial crisis. Uh, GFC 2008, they couldn't raise any money for the company. So now we've got this product. We want to acquire customers. We don't have any money for marketing. How do we do this? And so what happened is his dad left his job at the university, but he knew a lot of people in academia and they started going directly to different uh, institutions, door to door, selling uh, the software. Uh, what happened is the company grew from there. They had a pretty big market share in different universities, a lot of MBA students and researchers using their tool. And then we get to um, the growth phase. So they started in 2002 in the, great, in the financial crisis. In 2008, they wanted to grow. Uh, actually, sorry, 2002, the dot-com bubble. 2008, they wanted to expand outside of academia to other verticals. Again, there was the financial crisis. There was no funding available. So they pivot the product to serve more customers, but they continue this expansion of direct sales. They grow the company for another you know, four years. The first round they close is in 2012, and this was just a safety round just to have some money in the bank. So they raised $50 million just to put it in the bank. Um, and then they got acquired uh, by SAP in 2018 for $8 billion. Recently, they spun out of SAP in 2021, the IPO. So this is a company that lasted for 10 years, relying on direct customer sales and acquired customers through direct sales without advertising, you know, without a big marketing budget and without investment. And it's an amazing feat uh, for Ryan and his team he built a team of 3,000 employees based in uh, Central America, in Ohio. Um, and uh, this is Obama going to meet them because uh, it, it was all about job creation. How is this startup company creating jobs, not on the East Coast, not on the West Coast, in the middle of America, creating 3,000 tech jobs uh, with a simple product, with straightforward marketing, going directly to customers. So what we learned from this here is the way these guys executed is that we think as startup founders, I need a budget, you know, I need a big budget to market and to get people into my product and to acquire customers. And these guys did it without budget. They started with him and his dad, and then they hired salespeople, but they didn't look for impressions. They didn't look for video views. They didn't look for ad budgets. They figured out who is my customer? How do I get to that person? I pitch them and then I get them acquired into my company. So this is an example of, like the very customer focused mindset. How do I reach my customer and acquire them without thinking about the barrier of I need to have a big budget to execute. And that's why I like to talk about this as a case study. Um, and again, they had 3000 employees. So this is a pretty scaled organization that scaled uh, bootstrapped without external funding, which is amazing. So Customer acquisition is important. There are ways to do this without requiring a lot of money. What is kind of the process to do it? That's where this kind of ends up going. Before we get there, before we get into the process, one last thing I want to touch on in terms of mindset. We meet a lot of startups that think, I can't start marketing my product until the product is ready. Uh, are you guys familiar with this company? You guys know who this is? A lot of no's. Yes, no. some yeses. So Pebble Watch is kind of the precursor to the Apple Watch, to the Android Watch. It was one of the first smart watches to come on the market. And they were also, um, uh, they hold the record for the highest Kickstarter campaign, both for their first launch for the Pebble One and for Pebble Time. They basically broke two records uh, when they first launched on the platform. Uh, Pebble, the first Pebble watch raised, I think, uh, $10 million in pre-orders, which was the highest ever Kickstarter campaign at the time. And then the Pebble Time is the highest Kickstarter campaign in history, which raised, as you can see here, $20 billion through 78,000 pre-orders for the product. So again, this is here, a company selling a product that isn't ready yet. You can start your marketing before the product is ready. You can start your marketing, you can acquire customers that can commit money before the product is ready. Uh, if you look at how they did the first launch, um, they invested a lot into a video that explains how the product works, it showcases the watch, it showcases how you use it. Uh, but they also built a network of bloggers. They had over 70 technology bloggers 
that they convinced to kind of basically do a press release or an announcement of the product launch that drove traffic to their Kickstarter page. And that's how they secured the first $10 million in orders. Uh, the reason they did this is they couldn't fund money and they couldn't fund the company. They had a previous company that sold 1,200 watches that were only working with Blackberries. Uh, they interviewed those 1,200 customers. They figured out what was wrong with the product. They came up with a pebble as an iteration on the product. But when they went back to their investors, the investors didn't want to fund the next iteration of the company. They tried to get external funding. They couldn't do it, so they went to Kickstarter. And really, this is one of the most viral Kickstarter campaigns. Uh, and again, they raise a lot of money through marketing before the product is ready. And this is something you should think about. We have a lot of uh, startups in the cohort that are idea stage or really early. You should not be, let's say, uh, cautious about starting to communicate your product. You should start as soon as you can and start to build those lead lists. And that's why I like to talk about Pebble. Any questions about this? Cool. So far, so good. So far, so good. Very straightforward. Start early. Uh, I, I, I do have a question here, please. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, uh, that, that might work for like uh, a tangible product, but what if it's like an intangible pro product? Intangible. Uh, very, very, as... very good question. Are you familiar with how Google launched Gmail? Sorry. No. Well, yeah, it goes by invitation, so you invite a friend. Yeah. Yes, so Gmail was very exclusive when they started. It was an invite only. You could invite up to 10 friends. Uh, and a lot of those invites waited in like a waiting list. So even though it was a digital product, you had some people who tried it and thought, this is amazing. This is the best email client I've ever had. It's really quick. It doesn't have ads. Uh, it's really easy to use. The interface is modern. I'm inviting my friends to it. And then your friends come in and they go into a waiting list. Yeah, but okay. it was ready, right? The service was ready for like very selective group of people but in yes. this case here pebble wasn't ready so, they yes. just invested in video am i right right so whether it's a physical product or a digital product you can't communicate to your customer the benefits of this product how it's potentially going to work and how it's going to help them in their life moving forward right and based on that they can make a decision am i interested in this and do i want to sign up for it even before it's ready so whether it's a physical, it's actually worse for a physical product because you have to actually physically build it. Like when I take a pre-order on a Tesla, that's a very big commitment because they actually have to go to the factory, build that car and then ship it to me. And people were willing to do that kind of pre-order, put the money down and wait for a year. Digital products are much easier to produce, theoretically much faster to bring to market. The challenge there is that you can't produce a video to show the physical product, but you can create a video that communicates how the product works, what are the features, and what are the benefits? And yeah, that's Dropbox did that, right? Like before yes. they launched, they did like a like marketing promotion and like videos, and they had like a email list and, and that kind of group, right? Exactly, exactly. So it is possible. This is not exclusive to physical products. I, I wanted to make a comment actually. Yeah. It's actually much more critical for digital product to start marketing ASAP because. SEO, you know, you have to, SEO is just time. You just got to be there long enough before you get picked up. Um, and if you don't start soon enough and you start after you launch your product, you're going to have to wait another like two, three years before uh, your SEO is, is any good. Can I say something? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, Haytham, I don't really agree with you. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, especially for the hardware products. I think they have already built their uh, product and they're waiting to race for the mass manufacturing. Because if they want to they wanna wait for, for orders, etc., at least it will take one year from the design to the pre-mass manufacturing validation to the mass manufacturing validation. I, do, I, don't, know, I don't think that customers will wait for that. So for, uh, we did this mistake once we began um, um, marketing our devices even before building our devices and the, the customers um, were waiting too much for that and they were disappointed so i believe that you have to build your prototypes first you you're gonna do your pre-mass manufacturing then you're gonna do uh, this kind of campaign to 20 million dollars it's huge it's directly the mass ma manufacturing so you will have hundreds of problems especially regarding to the hardware stuff so i don't i don't agree that you have to begin marketing your stuff before building it 
And this is why where we, we are seeing it. a huge amount of startups are focusing on marketing rather than focusing on their products. So okay. this is my opinion. Okay, so uh, that's, that's a, there's a nuance there, and that's a really good point. So when we're talking about Pebble, they had the first product, which they used in the videos, right? So they knew they could produce this. Uh, scaling it up is a different challenge. But so I'm not selling something that I'm not sure I can produce. If I'm very far out, if it's deep tech, and I'm not sure I can even build it, then maybe what I'm marketing for is to get beta testers or to get, you know, initial feedback or to get customers who I can interview about their needs. Right? But I'm still building that list of people. If I'm taking committed orders and I'm two years out, yeah, then that's very difficult. Yes, Tesla was able to do it, you know, because of Elon's reputation and because they had built the Roadsters uh, before they went to like the Model X and the Model T. Uh, so you are right. There is a balance there. Uh, people don't want to wait for too long. But what we see is sometimes we see the founders are iterating on different versions of the product. Uh, they go through this accelerator and another accelerator. Or they've been through three accelerators before they get to us and they still haven't launched yet. And there are different versions of the product that are ready to go, but they don't have any traction. They don't have any potential customers. They don't have any beta testers. And I think that's the other extreme. So between right. those two extremes of I'm, I'm waiting to be 100% ready to go before I do any marketing or even talk about my product. And the other extreme, which is I'm marketing way before I have anything tangible that I have, like I don't have a level of confidence that I can deliver. Somewhere in between is the right time to start marketing. And for a lot of people, that is before the product is fully ready, because those users can start testing it. They can give you feedback, and that is very valuable to kind of iterate on the product. Yeah. Uh, Does that make I, sense? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I was had a case study with me when was uh, when with me I was in Royal Royal Guard. When there's a, an opportunity with with the Royal Guard, they want to build an, an armory locker to to a system to managing the weapons inside the uh, Royal Guard. Okay. What I found that time is an opportunity to front my uh, for, from the also all, all officers that we can build our in-house uh, M-Army locker. I made only a 3D presentation of the concept itself, only 3D concept. I get the deal directly and I get the next, next purchase directly from my previous startup without having anything, only 3D presentation of my concept. And it's what's very amazing. This is a really case study. It came to me itself. Right, but that in itself, Abdullah, that's validation that the need is there, right? And that's that's really important. So again, if we go back to investor perspective, I'm looking, I'm judging what you're talking about. You have this 3D model. You're going to tell me it's going to be awesome. But then you already have a purchase order in hand. Yes, I we, we made it, actually. We made it. Then we get right. another, uh, we know the orders. Then when you made the POC, the request, OK, you can build this thing, yes. They give me, uh, I promise for BOC for 300,000. We made the BOC, then said, okay, we have 50 uh, armories. Can you build it? We made it the first one. Then we got other orders from Qatar. It's, it's become like this. Amazing, amazing stuff. All right, so. Hi, so just to add to it. Yeah. So a little bit from more pure manufacturing background. So we, from my experience, we always strategized having sales, more sales, even though they're unfilled, was better than being on the other side. Uh, so we used to launch 10 products per month, variations and iterations, and every project we used to sell to had a variation, uh, but we never preferred having a product or a design made and then go to sell. Rather sell it on paper, uh, based on our other experiences and whatnot, and then let them give us the order to then build it. And even if you fail, even if there is delays, we didn't fail as such mostly, but the delays and, you know, uh, the promises, if you're, if you're unable to fulfill the promises, that still work out to be better than not having that order, or not selling in the first place itself. Right, because, you know, the opposite is you're carrying inventory, which is a cost of capital. You're carrying inventory and you need to liquidate that. So you're already thinking about discounting and, and yeah. Yeah. the opposite is I have too much demand and not enough supply, so I can raise prices, right? Yes, and yes, match yes. the demand and supply. So a really, really good point, Abdullah. So just to kind of recap on this first section, the three examples that we talked about, we talked about Netflix and customer acquisition, we talked about Qualtrics, and we talked about uh, Pebble Watch. Notice in all three, we're not talking about awareness. I'm not talking about ad impressions. I'm not talking about video views. I'm not talking about influencer followers. So 
first step in being a startup marketer is forget about this awareness thing. Like if you meet somebody who's going to be the CMO in your company or you want to hire them to do marketing for you and all they're talking about is we need to build awareness and they have no clue how that awareness is going to result in, you know, transactions, pre-orders, uh, customer signing up. You need to kill all those ideas because they are not useful for you. They are big company games, Pepsi, Coca-Cola, FMCGs. Those guys build awareness because they've already validated the customer is there. They've already built the channels to sell the product. So yes, they're focusing on awareness might make sense. For you, it's a different game. It's not about the number of impressions or views. It's about the people that are kind of come directly and buy the product. So that's kind of the first learning here, deconstructing how you're going to think about this as a marketer. Um, so now let's zoom out a little bit because uh, there's a lot of things that we can include in what we call marketing uh, and think about kind of our relationship with our customers. So happy couple, Mr. Wright and Mrs. Always Wright. How do we think we got to this point? How did they end up being together? How did they end up being a couple? Can you tell me a little bit about their journey? I think the first thing he said is, you're always right. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> no, but thinking about this relationship, how do we get to a point where these guys are married uh, in a stable relationship? Okay. The guy made a lot of sacrifices. <laughs> yeah, compromises, <laughs> exactly. Okay, but to be realistic, so I think uh, the there's school um, sweethearts. Uh, common ground. Sorry? Uh, school sweethearts? Or school college sweethearts? sweethearts? So they met but a college. That would make. Uh... They are just two models. <laughs> so mainly, I would say common interests. Common interests? Okay. Yeah. I think I think that this the answer can vary, depends on uh, everyone's uh, like perception of a relationship or maybe to their historical um, relationships. What happened with them during their life? Uh, it could vary, and um, many options may be right, and many options may be wrong. There's like no uh, one path that can um, like describe the relationship. That's true, but how do they get to the point of knowing that uh, this is the right person for me or this is the right fit for me in terms of what like I'm looking for, what they're looking for? It looks like they are the only one on the island, left on an island and met up together. <laughs> Process of elimination. No, no, that's not the right way to think about this. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe doing a, based on their metrics, let's say we want to do our metrics and know our metrics and milestones. And we'll try and iterate and try and error until we meet this forecast or this metrics that, uh, and then we know that this experiment, like AB, AB testing and marketing. So until you get to the objective that you want to reach. So try and error, try and error until you find like, yeah, we can, we can, I, I don't know, we can overcome all these obstacles, all the the fields until he, we know loved, the right he loved her SEO uh, results. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a bit too maybe, maybe it's a perception, perception of um, what is a Mr. Right and what is a Mrs. Uh, right. Uh, okay. He sees a Mrs. Right um, in, in a way and um, she sees a Mr. Right in a way. And uh, that's probably into psychology of, uh, of the different genders. But that's probably there's some of that. So we talked about perception, we talked about trial, we talked about fit. Uh, any other ideas? I guess maybe if I add, I would echo the last opinion, but for the dilemma everyone has in their mind of what is the right person for them, probably that's what they feel and believe is the right person. But okay, like, so they have, they have their own preferences that they're looking for to kind of match, all right. So I think add, managing uh, expectations a little bit. Yeah. Maybe they were. It, it could be a de facto thing, like uh, if it's like an arranged marriage or something, then uh, I have to deal with that, right? Right, that's true. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, assuming, I'm assuming this is not arranged, but yes, recommendations. So tell me a bit more about that. So the girl was recommended by the parents, by a friend. But that doesn't marriage. mean it's, it's the right person, so they don't get to this point, right? They might be recommended and then they... Adaption. Adoption. Okay. Interesting. So it's a journey. Like the person that said it's a journey is definitely true. It's a journey and there's an iteration, but uh, it starts with perception. You know, whether somebody recommends you or you see that person or you're interested in them, there's some reputation, there's some initial interest, there's some perception of that person that 
makes you interested in talking to them and meeting them. But then it develops from there. You know, perception is not the whole relationship, right? So it goes from there to, let's say you meet them. You get to know a little bit about their character, how they think, how they behave, how they do different things. You ask them a lot of questions on the first date. What do you like to do? What are you interested in? What are you passionate about? Right? And then the, the relationship develops. You start dating. You start meeting them. You start saying, is this the right fit? Do we have the same priorities? Do we think about the same things? Can we actually agree uh, on how to build a life together? Right? And then it gets deeper and deeper. You know, you either travel with them, you get married, you get to really know a person. You know, they say you never know your friends until you travel with them. Why? It's because when you travel with them, you know their reality. There's no more, you know, perception. There's no more fakeness. It becomes really real. You know the person, how they think, how they operate, what they like to do, uh, what their routine is like, you know. And that's the reality of the person. But then maybe you decide, okay, this is the right person for me long term. And you get into commitment and uh, you're happy with the relationship. So if we think about ourselves as marketers and we think about our brands and we think about our products, and then we think on the other side, there's this consumer that has a need or that has a perception or that has something they're trying to achieve, a job to be done. right? And they're going to go through some journey to decide whether we're the right product or not and whether they actually commit to having us as their subscription or stay with us long term they also go through this journey they may have heard about us we may have been recommended to them and you can think about kind of the customer's journey uh, mapping to different marketing activities as you know your brand has a reputation probably based on your pr and what people have said about you then there's the brand experience when you start engaging with the website and the app and you try to look at the product and you try to see what the brand is about and the company is about. Then maybe you get into a sales cycle and you're here, you're thinking about, is there a fit? Does this fulfill my needs? Are these the features that I'm looking for to make the purchase? But then after you make the purchase, you actually experience the product. And then, you know, for real, like everything that came before that, was that fake or was that real? Is this product really delivering the value? And is this something long term or not? And if it is, then you move down the funnel kind of to loyalty and advocacy. Like I'm loyal to this product. It really fits my needs. It fulfills what I'm looking for. And I'm going to tell people like all these great things about it because I've gone through this journey and now it's not just a reputation that I've heard. I've actually experienced it firsthand, right? So if you think about just human psychology, how we operate, how we look for things, this is kind of the marketing journey across different marketing practices, public relations, branding, uh, sales, customer experience, advocacy, and loyalty. Now, the thing is, we live in a digital world. We're talking about Web3. We've already crossed Web2, which is social media. In Web2, like, there's a big argument about what part of this journey is marketing. Is customer experience marketing? Or is that product development? Uh, is public relations marketing? Or is that something different? You can see these debates happening online. But since we live in Web2, in social media, actually, the customer has the voice here, right? Because the customer can talk about your company. The customer experience drives your reputation. It tells people about your brand. It can influence sales. If you have a poor reputation, people won't buy. And it affects loyalty and advocacy. So what I'm trying to say here is we are in a relationship with our customers. We want to build that relationship. And really what we say about our product, how we promote, uh, everything that we do can fall apart if you don't have happy customers. Do you guys agree with this? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So if 100%. Does anybody disagree? No, we're all in full agreement. And um, no. maybe in some cases, there is okay. no other equivalent option. If there's yeah. no other option. Yeah, if you yeah. have a monopoly, that's, you know, yeah, that's monopoly amazing. Then, yeah. <laughs> monopolies are not bad, you know. Some uh, investors I would look say for depending monopolies on the percentage today. of the happy customers. Right, so you, that's part of what your goal is to, to make sure the customers are happy and to increase that percentage. Um, but if we all agree, you know, then what's our job as marketers? What's our first job? Bring the customers to us. Happy customers. Customer service. Happy customers. How do we get to happy customers? Get customer journey. That's five the customer them. needs. Talk to them. Talk to them. Uh, I think, uh, uh, I think uh, uh, marketing needs or mark main job for marketing is to uh, increase our, our customer awareness about <laughs> my product is to bring them and to to 
to build uh, something culture uh, why they what the benefits that would be added if they use my product something like that so but let's think about that so i build a lot of awareness uh, 10 million people now know about my product they come and try it and the product sucks they go back on social media and they badmouth me what happens to my marketing drop right it destroys everything i'm doing right so awareness is not the answer a lot I, of people I believe knowing about me is not the answer yeah i believe uh, on, on the customer success uh, thing like already you acquired your customer he he is here or she is here now on your journey and you the customer success uh, process is getting feedback from him try to uh, work side by side with his needs the cost expenses and talk to him much more so even if he stopped using your product he won't get a bad and you get a good feedback or a criticism that will get you this customer after his churn because on, on the after the churn we have a returning customer a returning lead so maybe you lose him now but you can earn him or win him afterwards so customer success is the the i don't know is, is the key for me i okay. i i think i i think uh, being a startup we have to identify who are our customer as a first step once we are, are able to identify who are our real customer then we can easily develop and uh, process this journey towards the success identification of the customer is very important and being exclusive if you don't have to spend a lot of on marketing and they can give you uh, feedback on your product as well and they can work as a brand ambassador for your product as well awesome so customer discovery before marketing for sure i see a few hands that are up we have matthew we have amon or yes amon yeah, uh, I just wanted to add why I think um, with the example you use in the beginning, have 10 million people speak about your product and it, it ends up it's not a good product, it sucks or whatever. Um, I'm a true believer of even bad marketing is it's, is marketing. Um, if you have people speaking about your product, let's say we have the 10 million people speaking about your product, even if it's bad or if it's shitty or whatever, it's not working. You will have those 10 million people telling at least one other person that this product is really bad. And all you need to do is start the talk. I know it's different for, let's say, a startup or, or something, someone who's trying to get into the market or make a name into like a existing market or trying to hit an, a monopoly. But otherwise, if I have a product that I feel is breakthrough and I have 10 million people just talking about it, giving me a, a shitty review, even I have something to work on from there. I have these people that I can I have acquired in a sense that I have made a network who I can go back to and be like, hey, listen, what about this? What if I did this? And I listened to you and I did this instead. So from there, I feel like there's a big part of your marketing is your customer service or how you treat your customers, even when they're not your customers yet, or even if they're bad, they're customers that you know your product didn't really do well with. You have a lot of work on with data and web, web two and even now web three, you have so much, you just need someone to start talking about your product whether it be good or bad, you have something to build on from there. And I feel like a lot of startups get disheartened when they hear like your product's not going to work or it's not going to, it's not good enough. Or maybe if it had this or that, uh, because we feel that we, our product, we, we didn't receive a lot of bad marketing, but we did receive a lot of customers telling us, okay, what if you do this instead? Or what if you do, you just have to make it very positive and have this loop going and people keep talk, talking about it, you know? Okay, so I, I think you're kind of you're conflating two things there. Like customer feedback is always good, even if it's bad feedback, right? But then if they go publicly on Twitter, if they go on Instagram, they go on TikTok, and they start bad mouthing your product, that becomes your marketing. So think about when was the last time you bought a product where you actively saw somebody on TikTok, on Instagram, on Snapchat telling you this is a horrible product, and you went to look like, oh, it's horrible. I'm going to go find it and buy it. It just I it actually have happen. I I have a. I'll just keep this short, but there is a recent product in the market that has to do with women. It's a women hygiene product where they remove okay. your hair by just rubbing it. And they had, they've re received like a ton of backlash just from uh, customers and like people commenting, but yeah. it keeps showing up on my feed. And now because it keeps showing up, I don't know if their, their SEO is working or what's working. It just keeps showing up just because I feel like a lot of people are talking about how bad it is. And I just want to see, I saw that one product, Elixir, it's called the Elixir. Um, okay. And now I see like 10 other products that are doing, that are making better sales and they're getting better reviews. So it's just a, just an example to like what, what I was trying to say, but yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. It's you, I mean, your product has to be good at the end of the day. It's not like you just put out a bad product and get people to talk about it. Agree. All right. Okay. So that's yeah, a very, let's say a very risky strategy that you're going for there. Uh, 
Uh, I wouldn't recommend it, honestly. But yes, there are ways to salvage bad reputation and to kind of bring back your reputation. There are ways to, to, to but again, we all agree that there is a lot of power to what the customers say online, right? And in some cases, it outweighs the power that you have as a brand if you have enough people talking about you positively or negatively, right? Do we agree with that premise? I agree, yes. Okay. So I've got Muhammad, Matthew, and Sayyid that want to jump in. Um, yes, actually, um, I think the most uh, important uh, function with the, the marketing uh, do in the company is to build a great customer uh, journey in the customer experience uh, steps. Since awareness, where did you hear about this company? And then while you are trying that product, the marketing should involve in uh, how the product uh, showed up for, for the uh, customer and ending with uh, after service, even as a customer care and as customer success or customer service, whatever you can call it, new startup. So I think this is the important point in marketing. I, I, I agree. We're going to talk a bit more about journeys and about how that works uh, in a little bit. Uh, maybe Matthew and Sayed, and then I'll move kind of to the next point. Yeah, basically every startup uh, founder, you know, they dream that they will be driving a Ferrari in six months because they feel that, you know, their product is going to be the best or the super duper where every customer will be subscribing for it. Now, at the end, whatever product you make, Unless and until it is meeting the requirement of a customer, it is not going to be successful. So basically, you should be launching your MVP with the customers, taking their feedback. Maybe you can get, get some sort of a teaser about what is coming in, which is good, so that you know it will spread a little bit of awareness. But you try your product with your MVP selected customers, get all the feedback, what is additionally required to improve their customer experience, fix that, and then you launch. So when you have the customer feedback already and the customer buy-in already, then the chances of rejection will be very, very, uh, there can be, but you know, you, the, the customer uh, behavior varies, but at the end, you know, you can reduce the risk and then you start with the marketing so that you get a uh, more positive uh, vibe from the market and then you can progress and then you go for digital marketing or whatever is the mass marketing campaign uh, okay. where you can uh, have much bigger uh, customer acquisition i think uh, that can help okay say it say it, uh, say it, say it. Just, yeah so i just want to uh, highlight that this uh, any marketing is good marketing uh, or bad marketing is also good marketing so i think there's a difference uh, so if the feedback or if the if the awareness is about the product and they're bad feedback about the product, that's a, that's definitely not a good marketing. I think what is it said about is any marketing is good marketing is if you do a controversial campaign or if you cross some lines or if you sort yeah. of do something insensitive. I mean, yes, it's it's not about the product. It's more about the brand identity. And if even if it creates a lot of controversy, it's everywhere on social media. But no one is talking about the product in that case. So sure. that is that could be fine. But if it's a, a short, short bad feedback about the product, it's definitely yeah. a it's bad marketing. So I'll give you an example. Say just to kind of answer this, like notoriety, notori notoriety, notoriousness, or bad marketing is a good thing. When, when something happens, like this happened with Uber, it happens with other companies where like the, the spotlight is on the company in a negative way, it creates an opportunity. And it's not an opportunity for marketing. Let's say it's a leadership opportunity. If you get severe criticism from the market saying your company is, let's say, not environmentally friendly, your company use, uh, uses carcinogenic materials in the product, your company uses child labor, right? That puts a very big spotlight on the company. There is a moment there for the CEO to step up and, and take a leadership role and say, actually, we commit to one, two, three, four, and you can you can reverse that and you can fix the reputation of the company. So, yes, in some cases, uh, you know, no buzz is bad buzz or no, you know, you have the opportunity to turn it around. But again, that is a risky strategy. That's not how you want to approach the market in the first place. Uh, this is kind of a tangent coming off the, this exercise, but everything that we're talking about here uh, and why I showed this kind of example of the relationship is just to say that people usually think about product development as one thing over here and marketing is this other thing over there. So if I had asked you without this example, 
And what do you guys think is marketing? The, like the classic definition of marketing is this is, you know, it's a set of activities you take to promote buying the product, to build awareness, to get people to know about it, right? This is traditional thinking. This is what you'll see in a business school. Uh, and this is conventional knowledge. But actually what we're talking about is more on the right path, especially for startups. Marketing really comes from the product experience and people telling other people that this product really works. The power is in the hand of the consumer. It's not in your hand. They can quickly sway public opinion. Uh, people care about online reviews. People Google about other products. Uh, you listen to people around you. We are social creatures. And in trying to find the things that we want to buy and consume, we do consult other people. And so thinking of marketing as something that is completely disconnected from product development is a big mistake. And that's trying to what I was trying to get to. Uh, so then what is really marketing? The first thing you should do in marketing is you should fix the product, right? That's the best strategy. Uh, so thinking that I'm going to put lipstick on, you know, on a pig or how they say, like, I'm going to make this thing look pretty and sell it if the thing doesn't work. That's a really bad strategy. Let's make the thing work first. And I like one of the guys had a comment about you have to first know who your customer is. I like this definition of marketing. This comes from Seth Godin uh, in his book, What is Marketing? It's like doing work that matters for people who care about it. And that's two parts of this equation. One part is the people who care. So it's finding the right audience, the minimum viable audience, the smallest target audience that have a need and care about it. And then doing the work that matters, which is creating the right product and service that fulfills that need. If you can do those two things, you can identify the right customer, you can fulfill their needs. They're naturally gonna tell their friends, they're gonna tell their fans, they're gonna talk about it on social media, the marketing will follow. So if you had to redefine this in kind of startup terms, uh, work that matters for people to care about it is product market fit. First thing you do to market your company is try to find product market fit because everything gets easier once you've done that. If you focus on technical marketing, driving traffic, getting convergence, conversion rate optimization, all this other stuff, and the product isn't good, then you're just going to be burning a lot of money. You're going to be doing a lot of effort. And in the end, you're going to run into kind of a dead end. And I've done this with clients before where they paid us to promote their company or paid us to promote products. We drove a lot of traffic. It didn't convert. People didn't really want what's there. The value proposition wasn't there. You cannot fix a bad product. No matter how much marketing you have, it will not fix a bad product. So number one priority as marketers is fix the product. It's hard to say, but it's really how you should think about it. Get the product to where the customer wants it, likes it, and we'll talk about it. That's your first priority. After you do that, then let's think about more, let's say more tactical marketing uh, or what we say traditional marketing. And here's kind of where we think about what's the, a process to get customers into the door. Uh, any questions about that last part before we move into the process? So just a comment, I think so. So they said, you know, yeah. building a product that the market likes. I think uh, so this comes back to the to the one of the comments you made. You know, what is the minimum acceptable product or the perfect product? So obviously, as a startup, because you're doing iterations, you have to try to build the minimum acceptable features that 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 can just scrape off. You know, being a pass for the customer, and then build it up from there. Rather than you know, try to go for a perfect product or a perfect review, and then taking the marketing on from there. So actually, if you wanted to hack this, the right way to hack this is not to build the perfect product, it's to build the smallest product that they'll talk about. And this is a really interesting technique. You know, your competitor might do 100 things, but there's one thing they don't do that you can do that will make all the customers talk about your product instead of the competition, right? Hmm. That, that's a good way to think about it. What is the one feature that my customers will love? And if I did that, they would care more like we talked about Netflix and uh, Disney Plus, right? Uh, both of those platforms have issues with Arab parents. Uh, there's different content on there that you cannot filter by like age appropriate or topics or things like that. What if I made a video network that could curate video from like all over the world, but I could control exactly what I wanted my kids to see. And I could build just that one feature, which is that filter feature. And I didn't invest in the IP, I didn't invest in the content, I didn't invest in all this other stuff that Disney and Netflix are wasting a lot of money on. I built the controls that you need as a parent to control the experience of what your kids watch. A lot of parents would use that and tell their friends about it, right? That is a very tiny product compared to what's in Disney Plus and what's in Netflix, right? So I can build a very small product that has a lot of marketing, let's say, uh, velocity behind it by hacking what is the customer really looking for? How can I delight them on that axis alone? 
And then that becomes my marketing because they'll tell everybody this product, it doesn't have all the content, but the content it does have, you can control, you can do this, you can do that. This is amazing. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. So once we fix the product, we want to do some more traditional marketing, let's say digital marketing. Here's where this is kind of a process that I've used and developed in the past. Uh, and it also addresses the concern that I see a lot of startup companies come to me and say, I've used Instagram, but it didn't work. Or I've used Facebook and it didn't work. Or I went to this agency, they told us to be on Snapchat, but it didn't work. And then they're not sure, like they're not sure how to dig into that. How do I make this campaign successful? How do I make my customer acquisition actually work? You really want to think about this. Okay, so I'm jumping ahead here. Before I jump into that, uh, let's do this quick exercise. Um, your job is to find in the next five minutes, a good set of headphones that you want to buy online between 50 and hundred dollars, go find those headphones and then drop the link in the chat. And then we'll come back to the process. Can we suggest our headphones? Uh, you can, but it's, I, I'd rather you kind of go through the exercise. The timer started. Try to post the link and only the name of the product, please. Just the name of the product, right? The link. The, yeah, oh, the yeah, link. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. The link. Link. If anybody wants to buy headphones, you know where to buy right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hello. We got the lesson with Jumia also. So I've seen a lot of brands. We got links to Google. We got Sennheiser, Razer, Best Buy, Jabra. So who wants to kind of jump in and tell me about the process? The, how did they get to this specific product? Easily. We go to Amazon, give me a headset between 50 and 100. I went to Amazon, uh, filtered uh, by price and filtered by uh, um, reviews. And after that, yeah, I chose this, the first one. 
with the okay. hygiene. Uh, I was I was lazy, so I asked Google. Yes. For uh, headphones between fifty and one hundred dollars. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for me, uh, yeah, but this, but this is this is not the normal attitude for from women. So this is uh, yeah, this could be from men. For me, I, for, for, for me, I <laughs> for me, I just like to use Google first if I want to buy something, and then I read a bunch of articles about them and reviews, and then I check. Yes, this is the normal attitude for women. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's not only for women. I don't know. I don't know I did the same. <laughs> for me, I read a, a blog about uh, headphones, and I, I picked one. I think okay. this is the right way. Uh, I think okay, yeah. uh, knowing <laughs> other uh, reviews just, and feedback. I didn't say is it a lot. I didn't say is it wrong or right. I just so, <laughs> so there is no. <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm buying something, oh. I need to know that it's good. Whether Let's it's come good. back to the discrimination. Hey, Sam, go ahead. Yeah, so the time out, guys. There's a lot of people talking at the same time. Oh, we say there's no right way. You know, this is customer behavior. Customers behave in different ways. So I'm just trying to see how you guys did it. So we have people that started with Amazon. People started with uh, Reddit, I saw. Some mm -hmm. people started on Google. Anybody start somewhere else? I, I started a uh, low item. I started from uh, uh, from, from basically a, a dedicated uh, forum, which is headfi.org. But I know that because I've been there before. So basically, it's a uh, it's a forum of uh, of audio fields. So that's and and the, you can you can sort by price. So I guess that's the more sort of a, of a, a, a trustable source. Okay. Any other approaches? I Yes, I. You start with YouTube. Yeah, look for reviews. Yes, you look I, for like unboxing and reviews on YouTube, and then you go from there. But how then? How do you decide where to buy it? Like I saw it on YouTube, but where are you going to purchase it? Uh, so usually they have an affiliate link uh, right under it, or I just Google the the my selection. But this is actually how I usually buy all my headphones. Okay. Any other starting points other than YouTube uh, specific forums? Any other way? Yes, uh, for me, I started with um, Amazon by uh, filtering and uh, checking what I really need. And then I took the product name and I put it in the uh, platform here in Germany called I Idealo. This is for price for person. So I know now there is another website that's selling this uh, headphone with a lower price. So I did this. Okay, so what do we notice about these different journeys? What do you guys think? Like, why do we do this exercise? That's all digital, all digital. All digital, interesting. Customer journey. Yeah, every customer has a journey. Every customer has a journey on all the journeys. Excuse me? People based. Every customer has a buying journey. Every customer has a different buying journey. Um, yeah, for, for me, it was uh, very important that after sales service of electronics as well. So I uh, bought it from, like I use the local market, which also have online presence. So I, if it's not working, I can go and return. Okay. So you care about uh, service and returns. Uh, yeah. Who cares about different so, things? Do we all care about the same I used thing? I had a different uh, starting point. I, I started with what I knew uh, myself. And then, uh, I mean, the headphones I use, AKJ. And from there on, I discovered the new uh, items, new releases. So my starting point was experience. Yes. So I, I've run this uh, exercise a lot of times with different founders in different countries. Um, there's a couple of main journeys, you know, uh, some people start with, let's say, researching on YouTube because they want to see the unboxing and the review. Then they go somewhere to compare prices because I know this is the model that I want, but I got to figure out where to buy it. I pick a vendor like Amazon or Best Buy or wherever it is. I add the card and I order it. You know, some people start on going directly to, like you said, a brand that I know. 
I know Jabra, I know JBL, I know Sony, whatever it is. I filter by price, I compare models, and then I buy it. So I'm starting with brand loyalty. Some people Google, they're just trying to discover everything that's out there. You know, they read some reviews, they look at offers, they might ask a friend. So the journey might be both online and offline. It might be digital and analog. It doesn't always uh, stay 100% digital. Like I might get a recommendation from a friend and I might start there. I might research and then go ask a friend. That's why I might jump online and offline. But in the end, there are different journeys. Uh, no matter what the journey is, it usually goes through kind of phases. Uh, first phase is kind of this awareness phase of trying to figure out what's in the market. Next phase is kind of an interest phase. I'm trying to figure out which of these models am I interested in. Uh, and then there's a decision phase. What vendor do I buy from? What price point? Uh, what after sales support? So you kind of look at the nitty gritty of where do I make the purchase and what comes with that? And then you take an action, right? This is called kind of the ADA funnel or kind of the the awareness, interest, decision, action funnel. Uh, but what's interesting here is more looking at the psychology of it. People care about price, they care about support, they care about reviews, they care about recommendations, they care about brand. And so really when you're trying to market, you really have to think about uh, empathizing with the customer you're trying to market to. Right? And a big part of this is understanding the customer psychology, like some people wrote in the chat, and the customer persona. And so kind of the cutting edge of marketing is to do persona-based marketing. Um, and the process that I like to use or the one that I work with, you know, in the past is a derivative of, let's say, the HubSpot inbound marketing technique. Are you guys familiar with HubSpot and inbound marketing? Yes. Yes. And it's all basically there's kind of two ways to do marketing. The old way is I do mass advertising on TV. I do mass campaigns on radio. I try to reach everybody. And that's how we think about how many people can I reach and this awareness based marketing. The new age marketing is all focused on the persona. Who is the right person? And where can I reach that person? And it might be very cheap, cost effective, and very fast for me to reach a cohort of the right people, explain to them what the value proposition of this product is, and get them to be customers. So I want to talk a lot about this journey, but I'm, I'm aware that we've been going for like an hour. Uh, an hour and 20 minutes now. Do you guys want a five minute break before we go into the process? Yep. Yes, okay, so let's do a five minute break and then let's talk about this persona-based marketing process. And five minutes is five minutes, exactly. exactly so we start minutes. at the five minutes, not five minutes and six minutes and seven. Um, if you don't mind, can you recommend some, um, uh, some books or materials for the... Uh, uh, the uh, hub uh, you mentioned two marketing yeah. techniques. I so just... HubSpot has the HubSpot Academy. If you Google it, they've got the inbound marketing certificate. It's free. Uh, part of it kind of promotes their CRM and their technology, but the fundamental marketing logic that they go through is is valid, and that's how you should think about it. Who's my persona? How do I reach them? Uh, how do I persuade them? And then how do I get them to be acquired as part of my you know, my customer base. So that's the one I would recommend, the HubSpot Inbound Marketing Certificate. But we're gonna get, talk about kind of a, a summary of that here after the break. All right, we'll be back in a few minutes. Thank you. We're back. So let me go back and share my screen. Let's get into this. All right. So we talked about every customer is different. They do different things online. They get to us in a different way. Um, I get a lot of startups to come to me and say, we've tried you know, doing Instagram ads. We tried doing different techniques and they're not working and we're not sure why. And usually the best way to think about this is to kind of break it down into four complementary elements. You know, let's say I run an ad on Facebook and people see the ad, some number of them click on the ad, they come to my website and they may or may not purchase. That's a journey that the person is going through. 
you want to think about these four different levers that you can maintain, you can manipulate, you can adjust to um, to kind of drive the results that you want to have. Uh, so I can change the audience targeting. I can target different people. I can change my messaging, which is what they see in, in, in terms of the content of the ad um, or what I'm promising them. When they come to my website, I can change the offering, price point, uh, the subscription model, how they pay for it. And then there's the landing experience, uh, which is how quick does the website load? How do they find the product? What journey do they go through to buy it? What does my funnel actually look like? Do they need to register and sign up first? Or can they try it before they sign up? And so within that, you have different marketing tools that you can apply at different stages of this journey. So this whole process starts with the persona targeting. And this is also where the HubSpot inbound marketing starts. Who is the person that I'm trying to reach and how can I get them interested in my product? So when we talk about persona, a lot of people think about a UX persona. This is a kind of a typical UX persona. You know, there's the biography, motivations, frustrations. This is actually a pretty uh, well-developed, let's say, UX persona. But this persona is missing something. What do you guys think is missing here? Reviews? Is, uh... Other reviews for uh, social media or something like this? Okay. Uh, contacts. Where are the contacts? Contact. Call to action. Contact. Call to action. Uh, why the channels? Channels? Which can channels? Find them? Can how you tell me more about the channels? Yeah, that how what what, what channel they are preferred to uh, go uh, with? I would say the tr trigger, maybe. Triggers are important, mm -hmm. but that's a bit of motivation. Like why would they do yes. something? Actually, why why I I, I I sorry for interrupting, but what uh, in as a UI designer, the most important part to me is to see the visuals, their hair work. There is no even a thumbnails to see or a Behance link, you know? Okay, so what I'm trying to get to here is when we talk about persona, you'll see a lot of things online about building a persona that you can use to design, uh, let's say a product experience. And that focuses on the person and their attitudes, their motivations and frustrations, their jobs to be done, the needs, right? It may include favorite brands or aspirations, but what's always missing, and one of you guys got this right, is the channels. So when I talk about a marketing persona, it's a bit different than a traditional UX persona. And the main difference between the two types of personas is marketing personas include what channels the person uses. And whoever said that was 100% on track, spot on. So this type of persona, if I have 10 of these for 10 different potential customers for my business, doesn't tell me where I can find them or how I can reach them. So what I need to build as a marketer is I need to build a marketing persona that includes a little bit more about uh, the media habits of my customer, what they use, where I can find them. Uh, uh, question. question. Yeah, go at, ahead, at, what, at what stage we should have this mass, mass marketing and each type of segmentations you know, on marketing? So, so this is not mass marketing. This is persona driven marketing. Okay. Right? The persona might only be a hundred people in your country. Let's say I'm targeting uh, researchers who are focused on artificial intelligence within Saudi Arabia. That's my persona. There might only be 30 of those in Saudi, right? But those 30 researchers, I need to know what channels they use, what media they consume, where do they go so I can target them. Uh, do, so do we still call marketing, this? I'm sorry, do, do we call yeah. this a marketing persona or we call it segmentation? It's both. Okay. It's both. So you can segment by persona, but you can also segment based on demographics. You can segment based on age group. So they kind of intersect. Personas are usually more granular than segmentation. Segmentation can be very wide. I'm going to segment based on income level, but persona might be more specific. Like I said, uh, my persona is somebody who's a researcher that works at an institution. My persona is uh, the head of supply chain at a, a Fortune 500 company. My persona is the CTO at a company that has between 50 and 100 employees because you're going to buy this technology from me. Uh, my persona is a farmer who is looking to digitize their farm because there are some government incentives. Right? That's very specific. I'm talking about not all farmers. I'm talking about farmers who are interested in digitizing. So that there's some psychology behind the persona, right? And you can define as many personas as makes sense for your business. But this is the first step in building a persona-driven marketing plan is knowing who is the customer and 
uh, how I can reach them and how I can influence them. So within so, that, yeah. Basically, persona is more like a one-to-one -one mainly looking at that type of audience or what level you are communicating to, correct? Yes, but it's not it, it's not one person. You could meet a person who kind of represents that persona, but it's usually a group of people that have uh, similar interests, similar aspirations, similar jobs to be done. So when I talked about farmers who are looking to digitize their farms, it could be 500 people in Saudi. It could be you know another 100 people in UAE. It could be 5,000 people in Morocco. Markets will differ, but they're all going to be looking to digitize their farms because they want to improve efficiency. They want to increase yield. They're facing regulation. They're going to have some similarities between them that make their needs unique and make it very easy for you to understand how to talk to them how to communicate with them and how to persuade them to become your customers. So the first step is to actually build that persona so that you can put down on pen and paper or digitally capture your thoughts around what are these people's needs and how do we attract them to our business? Right? And this is part of that inbound process. I'm trying to attract people to come to me. I'm not trying to interrupt them with advertising and, and force them to buy. This is less of a sales process and more of a natural fit. And this goes back to what we talked about in the beginning of the session trying to build a relationship, but you're trying to convince them that you are the right fit for them. It's not that I'm trying to trick you into buying from me by discounting my product by 90% or giving you some special offers, right? So just to build our first persona to do this kind of exercise, let's assume that I'm selling consulting services to entrepreneurs and I wanna build kind of a persona of these entrepreneurs. Let's answer these questions together and see kind of what we come up with. First question, what magazines, what media do you guys read uh, to get educated on your space as entrepreneurs? Harvard. Harvard Business Review. Yeah. Western Middle East. Uh, Entrepreneur Middle East. Fortune. Magnet for me. Yes, Tech Crunch. Tech Tech Crunch. Crunch. Awesome. Technarch, Venture Beat, Magnet Wanda. Some of these are regional, some of these are international. So that's good. Uh, next question is What do you search for on Google that's related to you being an entrepreneur? What's related to that persona? Fundraising. Fundraising. VCs. How to find venture capitalists? That's How do I fundraise? Yes, accelerators. How do I create a pitch deck? How do I split equity with my phone that co-founder? Different yeah. things related to what you do day to day. Yeah. Marketing strategies. How do we develop a marketing strategy? Yes. These are all good answers. Cap table, yes. So another question is what topics or hashtags would you care about when you're an entrepreneur? Startups. Tech. Hashtag. Startups. 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 Yeah, startup, yes. Startups. 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 Entrepreneurship. Evaluation. Startup like failures. Startup failures. So that we Startup understand. Failures. Technology. Different technologies, AI. Uh, my competitor. Learning. My competitors. Yes. That's a good one. And then who do you follow on social media? Bulgar. VCs. VCs. Oh, YC. <laughs> YC. Other interviewing on the founders. Yeah, founders. Founders. Great. Other founders, other people that inspire us, organizations that we care about, maybe regulators that are important in our space, right? Competitors as well. Compet competition competitors, right? So what potential we clients. Potential clients, that's a good one too. Uh, so you can see here with just four quick questions. What do we do? We created kind of a persona of an persona. entrepreneur and understood a little bit about where they might be online, what channels they might use, what keywords they might search for, right? Do you think this would be helpful, creating kind of a marketing plan, targeting entrepreneurs? Yeah. Right. So who's done kind of this process for their company? I have a, a question. Uh, yes, isn't, and... it, isn't this too general? Like, I feel it's uh, it's really, really general. Like, as a persona, this is not... Like, I don't feel we can create a, a, a real concrete marketing campaign for this kind of persona. Like, I see myself as an entrepreneur and uh, like with the experience, like what you're looking for, where what who you're following is more targeted. 
depending on where you are, your stage, uh, what uh, kind of growth you're having and everything. So like from this, this look like this looks for me like way big, like a, a much bigger uh, amount of people based on just this. Right. So two points on that, Amira. Yes, you can make this more specific by stage, by vertical, by their interest. I'm not looking just for any entrepreneur. I'm looking for entrepreneurs in AI. I'm looking for entrepreneurs in deep tech. I'm looking for entrepreneurs in this country or region. You can always keep drilling down on this, right? depending on who you're trying to reach and what you're trying to target. But what I'm trying to get to is this practice of thinking about, I'm going to empathize with my customer and think about if I were in their shoes, what would I be searching for? If I were in their shoes, what would I be reading? If I were in their shoes, what would I be following? Uh, what hashtags would matter to me? This is the practice that I want you to do, is to, to step out of being the founder that's thinking, my product is great, everybody's going to buy it, and thinking about, OK, who really is my customer? And what do they do online and offline where I can actually find them, meet them, and interact with them? And that's the first step to building the persona. So at least by doing this, even if you think this is high level, at least I'm excluding people who are not entrepreneurs, right? And you can continue to develop your persona over time and drill down deeper and deeper until you find exactly the right audience that you want. So, so this is a good start. And what we're doing here is kind of looking at four categories of, of media habits. You know, what media do they consume? It could be YouTube channels, it could be blogs, it could be magazines. Where do they research, which is a different activity than consuming media? They could research on Google, they could research on Quora, they could research on question and answer sites. There might be vertical sites that are focused on different kinds of queries uh, related to what you're doing, whether it's agriculture, fintech, whatever it is, developers. I might search for developers on, you know, uh, DevStack or Stack Overflow or whatever it is. And then, uh, just a second, let me hide this. So uh, now the whole thing is stuck. Okay, so media habits, research, inspiration. Who inspires me? Who do I want to be like? And these could be influencers. These could be like, we can talk about Elon Musk or Jason Calacanis or different people that influence me in my vertical. And then who do I affiliate with? Where do I meet my peers? Uh, it could be a Facebook group. It could be a hashtag. It could be a WhatsApp group. It could be Slack. It could be Telegram. It could be Discord. Discord is really popular these days. And that's where I'm with peers who are talking about the same things. Uh, it used to be forums back in the day. And for each of these four, you want to think both online and offline. Because for certain markets, offline will be better than online. You know, there might be an offline organization that's focused on people with diabetes. And that might be if I'm selling products to people that suffer from diabetes, it might be a good way to go to that person, to that place and meet those people in person. Maybe it's harder to find them online. So you want to run this exercise of trying to empathize with the customer, develop the persona, both for online and offline. That'll give you ideas of where do I meet my customers, which are part of their natural daily habits. Whether they advertise or not, I can be part of that conversation. Does that make sense? Yes. Any questions about this before we move forward? I have a question. Yeah, sure. Um, what about if you're targeting the B2B? How can you describe your persona? It's the, it's the exact same process. If I am the hiring manager at a university, right? Then as a hiring manager, I need to read up on certain things to be up to date on my job. I need to take certain trainings. I need to uh, network with other hiring managers or network with other individuals in my career. There are some people that inspire me to do a better job at work. And there's places that I research about HR law or legal things that I need to do or how to train my teams or uh, software that I can use for HR automation. So in the end, you're trying to reach a person, right? A person who is a decision maker within that B, within that organization. So yes, you're doing B2B, but you're still <clears throat> trying to reach a person who is a person of of decision and authority. And so I would run this for that persona. And there might be a couple of them because it might be a complex decision. It might be the hiring manager plus the CTO plus the CEO. So then I have three personas and I might reach one of them before the other, but I can build that out so I can figure out where I can reach them. And then I can uh, run my lead generation campaigns from there. They can sign up if they're interested. And then I go into a sales call. Right? And that's where the process turns into fully B2B. I'm in a sales pitch. 
pitching my product to those three, CTO, CEO, and HR manager. And we take that into an offline sales. So the process can start online. It can end up offline, traditional sales. But that transition from online to offline starts with who is the persona, how do I reach them, and how do I capture that? Does that make sense? Yes. I see your company is called Algebra Intelligence. You might be targeting, you know, uh, <laughs> school headmasters. You know, you can do the same process. What does a headmaster at a school do online? How do I reach them? How do I get into a network online and offline of headmasters and headmistresses? There might be a convention that they go to every year. There might be an education event that they all go to learn about new technologies. Those are natural opportunities for me to meet them. So the offline part of this is also very significant. Uh, Faisal? Uh, I have to share uh, my experience of finding B2B customers. I often find my customers on restaurants, especially on Friday. My man as customers are small scale manufacturers and get they gather on a Friday or on a certain restaurant. So I, I can go there, I can introduce myself and I can easily onboard some of a uh, few uh, small scale manufacturers. So that's how we do it. Yeah, so B2B is, again, the offline part is important if you know where they're gonna be, if they're going to the same conference, if they're going to the same training programs, if they're going to some summits, sometimes you have like, a, let's say here in Saudi, we have, a, uh, Fintech Saudi is an organization. We have other organizations that are kind of, uh, so forget about Fintech Saudi. There are government organizations that are focused on regulating certain verticals. And what they'll do at certain points is they'll invite people from those companies within that vertical to come and discuss different challenges within that ecosystem. So a couple of years back, there was this uh, authority in the government that was focused on e-commerce managers because they wanted to increase the percentage of e-commerce in the country. And that authority would invite all the heads of e-commerce from different companies to come and have a summit to talk about their challenges with payments and deliveries and all that. And so now that I know that that exists offline, that is a list of people that are convening at a certain place. I might be able to get an introduction to talk to them, to meet them, to be part of that discussion. Right? And so if I'm trying to target e-commerce managers, there might be an offline way where I can get that audience and have 15, 20 minutes with them to present what I have. And then if they're interested, we can continue the discussion offline. So B2B, you want to think about that part, but you can also use LinkedIn, you can use Twitter, you can use some of the online tools as well to target a very specific job title or to target a very specific uh, type of online search. So we talked about research habits. If I'm searching for HR automation software, that is a very specific search. You know, you would not run that search if you were like uh, somebody who was not in HR looking to digitize or to do a digital transformation project. So thinking about the search uh, keywords for B2B is very effective as well. All right, so that's the first step. Who's the persona? Where do we reach them? The second step we get to is the messaging. Like, what do I tell them when I reach them? You know, a lot of people say just create content, create videos, uh, create ads, but what should go into that content? And how do I create content that is really compelling and attractive to my target audience? Uh, there's a framework that I like to use, which is called SAVE. Uh, anybody here familiar with the four Ps? Place, uh, place, place, people, yes. price, profit. Yeah, no, no. product, people. place, promotion. <laughs> product, place, promotion. People. And old school marketing. So there's yeah. a new version of this, right? The old school is the product, place, price, and promotion. These were kind of your marketing levers. This is the product. Here's where I place it. Here's how I price it. Here's how I promote it. This was kind of old school tactics. Some universities still teach this. The new version of this is save, solution, access, value, education. This is taking a customer centric approach. What is the solution? How does the customer access it? What value does he get out of it? And how do I educate him on the product and on the category even and on the competition sometimes to understand that I am the right fit for them? Again, going with that metaphor of relationship, how do I make them understand that I am the best product for them and they shouldn't look at any other competition based on educating them on how we approach the market differently, how my competitor does things differently why we have a competitive advantage, what makes us more unique to them, what makes us cater to this persona more specifically. So let's dive into this a little bit. So solution is what problem do you solve for them? How do you solve it? That helps them understand what your product does. Right? Uh, the value is what value do you deliver to the customer and how much you're charging for that? 
So rather than thinking about a price point, here's how I'm going to price my product. It's better to think about it in terms of what value are they getting out of it? And then what's the price that makes sense for them? Where if I'm giving you $100 worth of value, or I'm saving you an hour of your time, or I'm reducing risk by X, then how much money are you willing to pay to get that value extracted from uh, my product and service? Now that they understand those two, a big part of this is access. Where do I get your product? You know, I go to startup websites. They talk about all the features and all that, but I don't know where to sign up. I don't know what to click on. I don't know where to download it. You might not make it really easy for me to access this uh, value and this product. And finally, where can I learn more about this to make an educated decision? So these are kind of the four elements you want to think about. So let's run this as an exercise for Netflix. Uh, let's see. What's the solution that Netflix provides for its customers? On-demand videos. On-demand videos. Why do I need on-demand videos? Entertainment. On-demand videos is like a feature. Right? You know? Looking for entertainment. Large. Entertainment. A large yeah. catalog of productions, series, films for entertainment. View at no, your convenience, basically. Can you start with the first question? What does it solve? Uh, what solution does Netflix provide to its customers? Yeah. A streaming video platform. A streaming video. Why do I need a streaming video platform? I can watch at my convenience. My convenience. Entertainment. On demand entertainment. Okay, entertainment, convenience, yes. Download time as well. So, so nobody wakes up in the morning thinking about like I want to reduce my download time, right? Nobody, nobody has that job. Nobody has that pain point of download, right? They think I, I want to be entertained. I want to do something interesting, right? Let's again. You want to do this in a customer centric perspective. What what does what does your solution provide to the customer? Why would they want to be interested? Convenience, convenience. It's secure as well. I think right. it's a large variety of uh, uh, programs, whether it is movies or videos or um, uh, you know whatever. And uh, I can get access to everything, you know, most of the things under one um, channel. And uh, the price is very competitive. Okay. Well, one thing I would add to Matthew is basically all of that I can do it at uh, a click of a button. Basically, I think this is the best. I I, I think from a user perspective is the uh... The control over what you watch and when to watch and how to watch. Or, right. or maybe it's just I want to have fun when I'm bored. Personalization. Like, as a consumer, like just not being bored. So a lot of these are good answers. And again, I so just, just try to stay away from things that are related to your features, like button clicks, you know, technical stuff. The consumer is looking to be entertained, to control what they see, to have a good time. Right, that's the solution that you give them. The problem is, I need to. Be, I want to be entertained, and this is the solution that's out there. Um, all right, so I kind of jumped ahead. So, how do you access Netflix? Wi-Fi. You access it on Wi-Fi. Over mobile phone, computer, TV, any internet connections, TV, laptop, TV, any smart device, basically. Right, so smart device. You can get it online, you can get it on your phone, you can get the app, you can get it on a smart TV, right? I know yeah. this sounds fundamental, but you'll be surprised how many startup websites I go to and I don't know where the product is. Like, I have no idea, is it an app? Is it online? Are you gonna install it on my server? How do I access it? It's, this is, it, it sounds fundamental, but really a lot of people skip this step. And so as a consumer, I'm trying to buy this thing. You tell me it's gonna make my life more entertaining. I don't know where I can get access to it, right? Third one is value. So what value do you get out of Netflix? It reduces boredom. Reduces boredom. Entertainment. So access to the whole catalog at one price, one monthly price. Okay. Content. That's cool. Uh, can we take it one step further? Exclusive uh, shows to subscribers. Exclusive shows, interesting. Personalized uh, personally, uh, suggestions. Uh, oh, go ahead, sorry. sorry. Uh, personalized su suggestions. So personalized suggestions is kind of a feature. Uh, to me, I would say uh, the streaming quality, audio and video. Quality is a feature. 
not, it's not really a value or benefit. Can I say? can share my account with my friends as well. Right, so maybe let's jump ahead. You can share 10, for $10 a month. This is the value, you know, for $10 a month, you can have a babysitter, you can get movies at home, you can Netflix and chill, right? To get this, there's a lot of features that go into this, right? There's personalization, there's content, there's a catalog. But really, the reason I'm buying Netflix is, you know, I want my kids to watch something while I do something else. I don't want to go to the theater, I want we my can, movies at home. We can show this account to the, our family. Yep. Yep, that's the first one, the babysitter. And then, okay, how do I educate the consumer on what Netflix is so that they can make an educated decision about whether this is right for them or not? Give them a free trial, maybe. Free trial, but uh, library. Free trial? Yeah. I can uh, talk about the movies that we have and talk yep. about the library. Yep. Talk about the latest shows, the exclusive content, let them share accounts so that they can try it, right? But just a quick question. Why is the education different than the value that you're delivering? Is, is that expected? Yeah, so education is important because your customer is comparing you to other options, right? And the price point is not the only decision factor of whether I buy from you or not. You could be looking at, let's say, three cars. I could buy this car, this car, or this car. This one might be cheaper, but this one might be electric, right? And this one might be hydrogen based. So now convince me that the hydrogen fuel car is the one that I want to buy, even if it's more expensive. Then you want to educate me on why hydrogen is better for the environment, why hydrogen has a better footprint than electric, and why it's both of those are better than gasoline. Right? So that content that you develop to educate me on the market, on the competition, on the different verticals that are there, is going to help me make that decision, even if your product is the highest priced in the market. So it's not a value-based decision. It's a decision that's based on my understanding of what my needs are, what my aspiration is, what kind of lifestyle I want to have, and maybe you fit those requirements, even if you are the most expensive option. Does that make sense? I have a question. Isn't, isn't just ed education got to loop with a lot of like how we market the, these features or how we get them across? 100%. Yeah. 100%. So the latest strategy in marketing is I don't want to bombard you with ads. I want to educate you so that you come to the conclusion that I am the best product and you naturally want to buy from me. It's not that I'm trying to give you an initial offer to convince you to try it. It's not about like uh, promotion, because remember, we started with pricing and promotion and we're moving towards education. So it could be more expensive, but you will buy it because you're convinced this is the right thing for you. It's our unit setting for the position or? Excuse me? Is it our unique selling proposition or? So it's, so you don't want to think about selling. You want to think about the value proposition. It's your unique value, value proposition. proposition because this is not about selling. This is about the customer uh, researching, just like we did for the headphones, going to different sources of authority, asking their friends, looking at reviews, and then getting convinced, you know, based on content, based on blogs, based on reviews, based on social, they get convinced that this is the right product that solves my problem. And that's why I want to buy it. So you're, you're dealing with this more organically. It's less about sales and promotion. And it's more about getting them to actually agree that, okay, this makes sense for me. I'm not gonna buy it if it doesn't make sense. If it does make sense, I'm gonna buy it, right? So everything that we're doing now is customer centric. I'm trying to think about if I were in their shoes, why would I really pick this product if I don't understand what it does? And this is a big challenge for startups. You know, you have great technology, but explain to me how this technology is actually going to make my life better, better the competition is going to be easy to use. If you don't explain those things to me, I'm going to have a, you know, it's going to be very risky. I'm not going to purchase it. So just so we're on the same page. So uh, yep. the education does not have to be directly tied to the value. No, it can be education about the landscape. Here's the four different ways you can, you can get from Jidda to Riyadh. You can take a train, you can take a car, you can take, but here's why, you know, taking a train is the best option, right? And that might be comfort, it might be convenience, it might be that you can network, it might be a lot of things that are not just related to the value that you're getting out of it. It might be related to your ethics, what you want to purchase, you want to purchase only green products, so let me explain to you why our products are green, where we get our materials, how we create our dyes, 
And so in this method, you're really trying to educate the customer to make sure that they get to the right decision. And the decision, hopefully, if you have a good product, you know, we started with product market fit. If you have a product that fits their needs and you close that awareness gap through this education, then the natural result is they're going to purchase it. Abdullah, you got a question? Yeah, so Haitham, so this just sounds too slow, especially for startups where you're looking at, you know, fast growth. If you go the education route, instead of just telling them, listen, just buy this, and so, and the, so indirect selling just seems slow, you know, educating them, and then they come to you, they get to know about you, rather than just giving them what they want, that what you think you immediately and, and pushing it, you know, more aggressively, more directly for a sale. So, so what, what product do you sell, Abdullah? What, what, what's your service? What's your product? So we do uh, uh, build now, pay later. So it's like BNPL kind of a thing. So why should, I, why, should I, why should I do that? Why should I kind of take a loan from you guys? So we build the terms according to the market, a product that nobody else gives. Yeah, terms so and I conditions, see. which is very different from the market. Right. So what, what do you mean by that? So I give it for a niche. So contractors, I serve contractors, nobody else serves come to contractors. That's why you would take it for me. I build it for you. The product is built for you. Other people build it for uh, by users. For... All right. And, and there are, are there any, are there any hidden fees? You know, are there any tricks? Like, why would you do this? Why would you let me pay later? So I charge, we take a profit margin. Okay. How take a fee. That profit margin. Sorry. How much is that profit margin? So two percent per month what if i'm late on payments there is penalties right so every question that i'm asking you and you're answering me this is education you're educating me about your pro i can't i can't just say okay yes i'm gonna buy it i don't understand if there are penalties how you make money what happens if i don't pay as a customer i have concerns i have what we call fud fear uncertainty and doubt i can't make a purchasing decision until you address those points and the way to address those points is you need to educate me on your product, but maybe also on your competition. Because maybe if I've heard of somebody else and you come to me with a pitch, but that guy was recommended by another contractor, my first question I'm gonna ask you is how are you guys different? So unless you educate me on the differences and why your terms are better, I'm not gonna be able to make a decision, right? Makes sense. So all those questions that I'm asking you, I'm, I'm really, I'm being the customer. I have no idea what you, are, what you do or how you provide it, unless you can close that awareness gap and educate me on the product. I'm not going to be able to purchase. Um, how so, would you, if I may ask this a very good question, uh, right then, yes. how would you invent, uh, in, invest in building uh, content, or sorry, uh, information and education? I mean, yeah, so, as startups, we're all like five to 10 people. One person is working um, in marketing and most of the time we're, we're spending it on social media. I mean, the, the education you're talking about um, probably is one article per one word. I mean, I see the value of that, but it's a lot of work. Yeah, from my so, experience, it's been a lot of work. So it doesn't have to be uh, a lot of articles. It doesn't have to be a lot of videos. You have to think about, again, going back to the persona. Uh, I have a job. I have a pain point. You know, I want to buy a car. That's my pain point. And I somehow through an ad land on this website that's offering me Tesla. And I don't know what this is. So you have to educate me. Tesla is a new brand. It's based in the U.S. We believe in made in the USA. You know, our cars are different because one, two, three. What makes our cars awesome is this. Here's a video of our zero to 60 time. Here's a video of our manufacturing plant, right? You can build like very strategic content that addresses 90% of the concerns of a first time customer. That should get people to a point where they're ready to purchase or at least to do the next step, which is like uh, take a free trial or book a test drive or whatever it is that you want them to do. So the problem that happens with a lot of startups is you know the business really well because you've been working on this product for like a year, two years, whatever it is. You assume that the person coming in, landing on the landing page, knows everything that you know about the market. In fact, they know nothing. They know nothing about your product. They've never heard of your company before. They know nothing about the competition. They don't know anything to make an informed decision, right? So just thinking about what are the top you know, five or 10 concerns and maybe addressing those not with an article, but just with a little bit of information on your landing page. Here's what we do. Here's why we're awesome. Here's how where we're different. Here's a video that can build some trust and belief. You know, here's how we were mentioned in New York Times or mentioned in another article. Just a little bit of core content can actually rapidly close that gap and make sure they purchase from you. Does that make sense? Good question, Ethan. Yeah. 
question. Uh, when it comes to the to, to the to the whole business model, and and you you have to face the clients asking about the bad side. Uh, of course, yeah. I'm not going to go to the client as I don't mention and say, if you don't pay me on time, I'm going to close uh, your company. But he's going to ask me that eventually. And yeah. from what I understood, uh, you should, what you said made a lot of sense is you should actually tell him before he asks or prepare an answer if he does. Because I don't know if it's a good idea to just uh, give him that peace of mind, uh, neglecting all the good stuff that you do. And it's, it's a kind of a difficult combination of, of facing the customer and telling him the, the reality of it. Uh, so oh. is it a good idea to, to tell someone uh, the bad side of, 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 of your business or just... Well, yeah. It's it's not a bad side that I have, let's say, a late fee or, you know, different payment terms. I, I can always position that in a different way. Here's our terms of service. Here's our, our fee structure. Here's, you can read it and understand how it works. But it doesn't mean that I'm penalizing you. It's just explaining to you how the thing works because it might be okay. a new fintech. I've never I've never taken a loan as a contractor before, so I don't know how this works, right? So I'm, I'm not going to take a loan from an entity where I don't know how it works. So just explain to me the fundamentals. Uh, you don't have to spin it in a positive or negative way. I was playing devil's advocate because I was kind of trying to role play with, uh, with him. So I was taking the negative just to, just to show him that there could be a lot of uh, fear and a lot of uncertainty on the customer side. Uh, but uh, that's what I'm trying to get to. Just like that, that fundamental level of content that explains the service, what value you get, how you access it, and why this is the right thing for you. That's the kind of content you want to invest in. Does that make sense? That makes some sense. Okay. So, sense. so I'm running a lot late on time. We're actually over time. So maybe I'll just go through the next two steps very, very, very quickly just to complete the loop. So am I targeting the right person? Does my content make sense? Next step is kind of the, the offering. For the value that I'm giving you, does the price point make sense? Uh, is it a one-time payment? Is it a subscription? That's really easy to think about. How do I price based on value-based pricing? And I'm sure once we get into the accelerator and the in-depth sessions, we're going to talk a lot more about how you price based on the value you deliver rather than what your competitors do. The last part is kind of the landing experience. Um, so if you look at these three images, this is a landing page that Obama used to fundraise. Which of these do you think is the best performing image? One in the middle. One the, the second one. The second one, why? It's it looks more warm. warm. One on the right. A, a family yeah. person, so I can trust him. Looks like Left. a good guy. More person. Who's the target audience? The Third target one. audience are general Americans who want to vote in the election. This was actually, these are actual pages from the Obama campaign. We get involved. So who says the third and why? We get involved. Excuse me? The third, because he seems uh, to, to have a vision and it's colorful, it's not black and white. So it's a kind of a bright future waiting uh, for us if we vote for him. Okay, so some people think the second one, some people think the third one. What do you think is the difference in conversion rate between these three pages? How big is the difference? 5%, 10%, 100%? 100%. 30%. Just Seven. changing the image? 70, yeah. 30%. I think 80 or 90. 10 to it's, not not just, it's not just the image, it's even the, the messages that are with the image, that comes with the image. The get involved is very different than change we can believe in. Okay. It makes you feel differently when you actually read it. And learn Somebody more instead of find out. So there's a lot of uh, differences in the wording as well. Okay, so the, the actual difference between the first image and the third image, which is the last one. So this is an iterative process they went through. The last one actually performs 40% better than the first one that they started with. And they changed from get involved to change we can believe in. They went with the family approach. They tried that out. It worked a little bit better, but it wasn't great. But they liked the change we can believe in. It was resonating in, you know, in the campaign when they were going out and talking to people. So they tried to change the image to be more inspirational. And they ended up with 40% increase in number of signups. This actually resulted, I think, in 100 million additional dollars that went into the Obama campaign. The change, that 40% is $100 million. And this is part of how he was able to fundraise so well. 
is this kind of digital optimization that they did. The person that led the optimization on his campaign is actually the founder of Optimizely. And that company, that startup was created as a result of this experiment. They were doing this in HTML, changing images, and then they realized, okay, there's a need for this. Why don't we build a platform uh, that can make this easier for businesses? And that's how Optimizely was born. Yes, the third is the best performing image. So, uh, so how, yeah. Yeah, no, just quick one, Nathan. That 100 mil, was it uh, like small ticket donations or was it like lobbyism? Yes. Super no, no, no. All of Obama's donations were small ticket donations through Facebook as his primary page uh, and the email list driving to this landing page. Okay. What about the center one? So the center one was a little bit better than the first one, but it wasn't the best performing. The last, the best performing one was the last one on the right. So, but what we're trying to say here is like, again, going back to the customer journey, we start with the persona, we target them, they see some ads or some content, they come to our website. The experience on the website affects a lot of our customer acquisition. And simple things like changing an image, a tagline, you know, a few buttons here and there can have a dramatic effect on how many customers I acquire. Here's an example. This is one that I actually, I ran for a startup that we worked with. Uh, this is Vanilla SA. Uh, this is not changing the landing page, but just showing you some some of, let's say, the, 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 the effects of testing and measuring your marketing campaigns. Uh, Vanilla was an e-commerce based in Saudi. They used to sell clothing, apparel, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, perfumes, uh, shoes, and a few different categories. We launched about 13 different campaigns for them, landing on different parts of the website. We targeted different types of personas. We had different kinds of messaging. And for the same, uh, let's say for the same company, you can see some of these campaigns had an $11 cost per registration. Some of them had $50. Some of them would generate a sale at $11. Some of them would generate a sale at $73. Average order value ranged from $30 to $200. And the return on ad spend is anywhere between you're getting back, you know, 50 cents on every dollar to you're getting back $5 for every dollar you invest. So what I'm trying to say here is it's really important to test and measure what you're doing. And really what you want to test is kind of four different things, which is kind of what we talked about. Uh, you want to test your target audience. You want to test your messaging. You want to test the offer or the value proposition. And you want to test the landing page experience. Changing those four things can have a dramatic impact on your advertising performance, your customer acquisition costs, and your return on ad spend. And the four elements that we talked about, this is why it's important to do conversion rate optimization, app store optimization, and just making sure the fundamentals are really taken care of on your website. The website loads quickly. It's easy to use. I can go from page to page because those minor things, technologically speaking, have a dramatic impact on your return on, on ad spend. I'll give you a more recent example from uh, the program that I'm running at Kaust, Entrepreneurship Adventures. Uh, we launched the program in KSA uh, about a year and a half ago. We had a really good 15% conversion rate. We expanded out into GCC, Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, you know, uh, Morocco. And when we expanded to other countries, we realized that the page was very slow to load because it was a heavy page and we were getting slower internet speeds in other countries. Our conversion rate dropped to 1%. We had also changed our messaging between the first and second campaign from something that was very uh, emotional, uh, very motivating to something that was more tactical. Uh, focused on, you know, sign up here and get your course versus who are you going to be? What are you going to achieve in your life? And our conversion rate went down to 1%. So we went back, we fixed the website, we made it faster. We went back, we fixed the messaging and we got our conversion rates back to 12%. So minor tweaks, who's the customer? What's the messaging? What's the value proposition? And how does the website perform? Will have a dramatic impact on everything that you're doing. Uh, so I'm going to close here, run out of time. Uh, any questions about this last part before we jump off? Uh, feel free to raise your hand or just speak directly if you have any questions. I, I would love to any, know more about how you calculate some of the uh, uh, things that you showed us in the example. Just at least a, a quick overview. So, okay, so the, 
each of these on the left is a different ad group that we launched. Uh, for every ad group, we have given it a budget. So let's say I spent $500 on each of these groups. Uh, then we had our pixels installed on the website so I could measure how many registrations came from this ad set. And then you simply divide. I had $500, I got, I don't know, 50 registrations. So that's $10 cost per registration. And then from those 50, how many people actually purchased? And that's, you calculate the cost per sale per, based on that. Uh, the average order value gets sent from the website back with every conversion. You send back a conversion event and how much was in the basket. Uh, and that calculates the average order value. And then you divide the two. Uh, you divide your average order value by how much you spent on marketing. You get your return on ad spend. So if I spent, if I spent $500 and I generated $3,000 in revenue, that's a, 6 that's a 6x return on ad spend. So I do that for every one of these groups, and then I know immediately what's working and what isn't, and then I can go and iterate from there. Was it the message? Was it the targeting? Was it the landing experience? What was it? And how can I make it better? Uh, hey, Tim, one last thing. Um, I, what I'm getting is this is like a continuous sort of process. So do we have like a, like a level of optimization you want to reach and then you sort of stop or you do something new, or is it just continuously you improve the same thing, like for example, landing page, and then you sort of see where it's coming from and improve that. And Or do you like, for a company that's like, for example, taking orders online, we have like certain like um, uh, prompts that we want to achieve and then when we reach those, do we do we should we like stop or should we do something entirely new or what is the process behind that for 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 these for example um, examples that you use? Yeah, so it's 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 two things. One, it's a continuous process. You're always trying to improve. The other, it's 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 driven by your profit margins. If I'm spending a dollar on advertising and I'm getting two dollars back, mm -hmm. I need to have a fifty percent profit margin for that to kind of break even because half of my money is going into cost of goods sold. The other half can cover the expense of marketing. If I can't get to that parity, then what's going to happen is I'm going to keep raising funding for more marketing because I'm not making the money back in revenue. Right? There's so there's always a dilemma because we never know how much to allocate for, for marketing or how far we can go or if, if it's marketing is really helping us and if the ROI or the return on advertisements, like, I don't know what margin you should set. Like, does it depend on the product or does it depend on what margins you already have or... Yep. So it's a three-part equation. I, if I spend a thousand dollars on marketing and my margin is ten percent, I need to generate ten thousand dollars in orders, right? But if my margin is twenty percent, I only need to generate five thousand in orders. If my margin is you know ninety percent, I only need to generate I don't know uh, two thousand dollars in orders, right? So that's where raising your pricing, communicating your value, uh, really affects your marketing spend, especially your paid marketing. Right. Uh, so you can set a target for what is the ideal return on ad spend based on where my product is priced today and what my margins are. Mm -hmm. And then you can test and see, does this marketing make sense? Or do I need to find more efficient ways to do this? Or do I need to raise more capital uh, right. to cover my marketing expenses short term until I can figure this out and iterate on the product in the future? And this goes back to like when we talked about like the first thing you want to do in marketing is, you know, product market fit, right? Because if the product is horrible and you have negative reviews and people aren't converting, any advertising, any money you spent is kind of just burning that money. You're not going to get it back in revenue. You're going to right. be spending a lot of money driving a lot of traffic. They're not going to be interested. They're not going to buy. When they buy, they're not going to be retained. And what will happen is the lifetime value will be shorter because they might try it for a month and then cancel. Mm -hmm. And then you're not getting that return on investment, right? So the first thing you do is fix the product. After you fix the product, Focus on the messaging. What's the solution? How do I access it? What value do I get? And how do I make sure this is the right thing? Once you do that, hopefully you can raise your prices because the product is good. They understand what it is. Then if you can raise your prices, you get healthy margins, then you can spend money on advertising. Makes sense. I have another right. uh, quick question, item, if you may. Um, would you, well, do you recommend uh, staying doing uh, ads native directly on Facebook? Or do you um, rather have probably a HubSpot or Market Tool or maybe Zoho uh, to, to do the lead generation and focus on lead generation in terms of uh, marketing software? For a startup that is post revenue, uh, started making money, we want to double down on our efforts and our uh, uh, personas that are successful with us. Well, what's your best advice? 
you usually want to start with the free stuff, you know, the SEO, the uh, reaching the personas where they naturally congregate, going into the Facebook groups, naturally organically reaching them with organic tactics just to test, just to get them to come to the website, just to test things out. Then once you start having some revenue or you have some investment, that's where you can start playing with the paid marketing. But when you do that, you really want to measure the performance of that paid marketing. And then if some of your tactics on paid are delivering results, that's where you can scale them up. If they're not, you want to iterate on them. You never want to kind of burn a lot of money if on something that's not working. And so that's the natural progression is I'm going to do a lot of things that don't scale. Like we started this talk talking about Qualtrics. I'm going to go to people directly, show them my product, pitch it to them, get them to buy. That costs me nothing. That's, you know, sweat equity. I'll do that first. Then once I've talked to a lot of people, I know what their concerns and their fears are. Then maybe let's create some content around that and spread that content in the right places. And that kind of takes me to the next level. And then once I get a little bit of revenue coming in, that engine is kind of working. Let's amplify that with advertising. So you naturally go between those three stages. And that's how you grow from, I don't know anybody. I don't know who the customer is to like, I know what their fears are to, okay, now I can acquire thousands of people using paid advertising with a lot of amplification and reach. That's the journey you want to go on. Does that make sense? Yes, it's a per 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 perfect sense. Thank you very much. Any other questions? I think we're good. Thank you very much, Nathan, for giving us the time. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. This was fun. Okay. We'll go on a 15 minutes break. And then we'll be back. Okay.